Okay, we're live. Welcome to Dive Into World Building. And today our guest is uh, Mimi Mondal, who is a Locus Award winner, right? Yes. Oh and God. also uh, a nominee for the Hugo Award this year. Very exciting. You've got some really amazing things going on. So we're, we're really looking forward to talking to you. Thank you. Um, okay, what do we start with? What do we talk about? So, well, yesterday you and I had a conversation and you had mentioned that you have uh, a big world that is called, well, you called it several things, but circus world? Yeah, yeah. It's like the circus is called the Majestic Oriental Circus, which is, I mean, Orient is not usually a word to describe India, but it used to be. It used to be a word to describe all of the East, technically, like Edward Said, for instance, right? Orientalism is about all of the East. So because it's from like the early 20th century, yes, the circus is still called Majestic Oriental. Mm -hmm. I may change that name later. I have no idea. That's fine. So you've written already four stories in this world? I've written five stories and I wrote them for a very long time. So I'm not even that tremendously proud of the first story anymore. Mm -hmm. mm, I may have to rewrite it. The way I started writing these stories, I, I was still back in India and India did not have a very large science fiction or fantasy market. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know if I actually wanted to write a novel or if I wanted to write a short story and test the waters. So that series kind of grew. Okay. So the first story isn't all that great to me now because I think I've become a better writer. Yeah, I think, but that happens to everyone. <laughs> what was, so did you have a particular goal in mind in creating this world or, you know, what kind of stories did you want to explore there? Um, the first story was completely standalone. Like I was, I was taking a writing workshop at college for the first time. And this was like back in 2000 eight or something must be a decade is a decade mm -hmm. um, and till then i had not really written short stories i had written like beginnings of novels and middles mm -hmm. of novels not endings of novels um so i wrote this i started writing this one short story where i did a fairly large world and then i realized that it's not a short story world at all and I couldn't even finish that one short story. And the world kind of stayed in my head. Mm -hmm. So then I kept writing like little vignettes and characters in that world with like mm -hmm. over, over the years with no particular plan. So, and I mean, in the meantime, I stopped being a writer. I went on to be an editor. Didn't even know if I wanted to be a writer anymore. Mm -hmm. And when I started writing another story, I could see that this world is already there. So like that world kept getting discarded and bring, brought back. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, it's like a very, very unplanned world. And I grew up reading Discworld. And I, I think by Terry Pratchett, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think a small part of my brain was doing that chaotic thing where you start with a world and you kind of Keep writing stories in it and it goes in directions that weren't the exact plan mm -hmm. so i guess that's all i have to say about that world uh okay but i'm gonna ask you more questions about it <laughs> yeah. so um <clears throat> was the circus in it when you first discovered it the circus was not in it the circus was in um the circus was in the backstory okay so the first story had um, some people in this like shady cabaret kind of club, which was vaguely attached to like say a 1960s India. Because 1960s India still had like a like an underground jazz cabaret scene in some of the major cities, and um, I wanted to write a murder mystery in one of those, like you know this shady cabaret place where everybody looks like a suspect so there are like a lot of red herrings sure and um no one quite knows each other's background 
so that's the story where like these all these characters work together and like they have this unspoken code that nobody really asks about anybody's past and um there's a murder and then the police come in and the police like haul them all in together and this like this my info dump was basically a p- police questioning mm-hmm. so the police ask everybody like who they're fr- you know where they're from and things like that and each of them is suspiciously looking at the other and going your story is not true ah that's interesting so that's when one of the characters like the guy who organizes the group which was i mean very much like a professor x like character he says that you know i had a character i had a circus in the, like i was part of like i was a circus owner in the past mm-hmm. and some of, some of these characters were from my circus from the past and the others have like come and joined later and that's the first time that some of those characters find out that some of the others used to know this guy in his previous life Mhm. So that circus was just like a back story thing in that story. And so the, so when did it become a when did it become a central part of a story? Was it was it something that you pursued immediately or was it something that you came back to later? Much later. I I think that story because I didn't finish it. That was 2008. I came back and wrote a story in the circus i think in 2013 oh. which was like a self contained story with these characters like some of the characters and i sent that story to podcastle mm-hmm. and i also sent it to clarion west and i sent it to um several mfa programs where i was applying and so it ended up being my first american acceptance at like several places so clarion west took me on the basis of that story i got um. yeah so i got into pod castle which was my first american sale and i got into an mfa as well so that was that's probably my most accepted story so far very cool <clears throat> now so um if i if i may ask uh the circus is it um is it a is it a sort of a fantastical science fictional circus or is it uh a standard circus or what where exactly is the intersection with genre in this world um so the circus itself i i wanted to use that as a place where like a lot of odd characters come and collect and mm-hmm. so india did have a really I mean I I I read a lot of history and I like it. So I mean mm-hmm. I I don't think writing historical works is mandatory but I think that's something I like. Yeah. And um India had a big flourishing circus scene. Um is that mine? Um is there is there a distortion? No, I think there's a bird. Oh, okay. <laughs> um so through the 189 like starting from the 1890s to 1930s india had a very big circus scene okay uh, and the circus as a form i mean this is also probably is it parallel to the ringling brothers and i mean the all the big american british circuses i'm not entirely sure do you mean historically yeah 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 um i can look that up um so however so the circus clearly was a foreign form which was brought into india foreign form of entertainment mm-hmm. and it took in a lot of people who were different kinds of traditional performers so mm-hmm. so technically it's a very steampunky aesthetic yeah that it's happening later than when you ex- when you expect victorian steampunk to happen because that kind of you know like industrial life like urban life where like pe- people are coming in from their traditional societies and mingling in this like in this more amorphous space which happened largely say in london in the 19th century sure uh, that trickled into the colonies slightly later because that that kind of socialization mm-hmm. it 
you know, the further you move from the center, it also moves across time. Yep. So I thought that was a very interesting social space also because it's like it's big, breaking traditional social structures. And so in a city, in a circus, you don't exactly know who's who. Mm -hmm. And that creates a space for mystery and it let me explore a lot of Indian folklore and mythological characters. Yeah. So each of those characters, like while they are all pretending to be human and mm -hmm. normal, there's also kind of an understanding that you don't ask, but nobody else is normal either. <laughs> yeah. And a circus do, like lets you do that, like that kind of ambiguity, like you can't have that at an office, right? At an office, you need paperwork. Right. And it also helped me not base the stories in a certain place because the circus travels. Oh, yeah, that's cool. So, yeah, I mean, I was kind of trying to trick myself into writing a long narrative chunk by chunk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's cool. Have you done, uh, so have you imagined, uh, have you placed stories in different physical locations that we would recognize? I don't think so. I mean, this was largely my attempt to use not very well-known Indian mythology. Mm -hmm. So like small folklores and I mean, the things that I've learned over writing this series and the things that I'm still learning mm, were a lot of craft skills and a lot of things about gaze. So when I wrote the first story, I wasn't thinking of selling it internationally, right? Yeah. And so I was really just looking at an Indian readership and what an Indian readership would already know, like especially if you're writing a murder mystery, a murder mystery really depends on what you expect your you know readers to take for granted. Yes, if, if that's something like like a mystery is a genre where the reader is following the narrative gaze and trying to solve the mystery by themselves, right? right? So the cues given in narrative should be dis decipherable to the reader yep they're not then it's not a good murder mystery it looks right i understand that's a really good point and after i wrote that story and i kept trying to sell it that story did get rejected at some magazines at least like some american magazines mm -hmm. um, i eventually sold it in india mm. All the feedback I got was like the same, like, yeah, this mystery is not working out. And like, that was all the American response. All the Indian response was that, oh my God, this mystery is really cool. So, so it taught me something about how to place your stories according to a certain gaze, I guess. Yes, absolutely. So, so what, what were, what kind of insights did you pull out of that about expectations um, across in the different cultural groups? Um, I sold that story in India. I am still intending to do a rewrite on that story, like the same plot, but rewrite it in a different mm -hmm. framework and maybe sell it as a reprint. I don't know. Um, the interesting thing was that the second story, which is called This Solid Earth, Our Home, um, that's the story that sold directly to Podcastle. Mm -hmm. and I hadn't even thought about these things about gays and other things in that story. Um, so sometimes I guess like these theoretical things fall in place even when you're not thinking about them. Yes, that's true. And so that story had quite a bit of info dump, but the info dump was the info dump was some, like an older person telling a story to two children. Mm -hmm. And so, so he basically 
set out the terms of the world in a way if they were just two older people they would not do that right mm-hmm. um it allows for explanation to people who might not know things because they have very little experience right and these are like two children who are in the circus so this guy actually does the history explain because yeah i mean they wouldn't they're not kids who go to school they wouldn't know the history right um which kind of brings me to the point of like i okay better send it wait so i grew up reading indian magical realism also like some unrushdi largely um and they have a very different kind of world building like there's a lot of history that's not on the page because the reader is already supposed to know it mm so say for instance there's these midnight children which is about the indian independence movement largely like the indian independence movement in india right after independence yeah and that's a fairly well known history even if you can even if you just google it right um when i started writing these stories and when i like ran into that hurdle of people especially in america not exactly understanding it like mm-hmm. i i went to a, an mfa where i where like all my classmates were american they were not all white but they were all american mm-hmm. and once a very historical story get got read completely a secondary world ha ah, interesting yeah so that gave me some interesting perspective like especially i mean sure i was writing very something like when i say very historical i still mean like very obscure history yeah. but closely researched obscure history and my classmates just had no idea there they were just like you know this is really cool steampunk <laughs> yeah so i think since then i started reading more closely the narrative techniques of steampunk mhm sorry not not steampunk sorry um the narrative techniques of um secondary worlds okay it wouldn't have occurred to me that i was writing a secondary world i'm not really like my my world is quite close to the primary yeah real mythology and so on but i now write it from a very secondary world perspective assuming that no one knows what i'm writing about hmm so uh what kind of techniques did you discover on your study of secondary um i'm largely that people would not know what's going on in your world and then there are two layers of that just because i'm indian because so like when you're writing a western based secondary world people already have some understanding of a western based at least primary world right yeah. so like when you're writing a medieval you know european medieval secondary world it's become so easy to write that especially since dungeons and dragons since like many stories in that mode you no longer have to explain anything at all like you drop a paladin in the middle of somewhere people know what a paladin is <laughs> right yes and but in india already people have certain stereotypes of what say an indian god would be like right mm-hmm. and when i'm writing like a say a very local regional minor tribal god that god doesn't resemble a western god but that god doesn't even resemble an indian god hmm so i'm literally having to write that person's entire mythology in the text like this guy is not just shiva i can't drop him and expect people to notice him sure so have you found that the um making a text that can be parsed by Uh, an indian audience and an american audience and presumably a european audience all at the same time uh that there's a lot of overlap in the kind of background information you and and you know info dump that you have to do or is it like the american readers have very different expectations than the indian readers and you have to do 
twice the amount of background? Um, so something that I've noticed, and this is like me noticing this largely as an editor and um, also publishing scholar. So two, like, I'm um, so, sorry, um, earlier this year, I wrote two articles on South Asian, like the history of South Asian science fiction and fantasy writing. Um, it was published in Tor. And to do that, I looked up a lot of South Asian authors, both from India and like Pakistan and like both from the home countries and from the US and the UK. And I noticed that a lot of these writers' works don't translate from one part to the other. I mean, even within South Asian as a community. Mm. So a lot of South Asian American writers don't really translate to South Asia, the home countries. And that's partly because of that world building difference. Like when a South Asian American writer is writing towards an American audience, they're not entirely catering to the home country audience. And the home country audience does not always resonate with that. Mm -hmm. And so many times there are authors who are both my friends, like also my friends, who make the choice to either go for this audience or that audience, depending on where they're primarily selling. Mm -hmm. And I'm still like very aspirationally trying to do both. Like I will probably stay in America, but I mean, all my people are back in India, all my friends, like, I mean, not all my friends, I have American friends too, but like a large number of my old friends and contacts are back in India and all my family is back in India. So I would still like to write stories that get published and read in India. Um, so I end up following, like I end up looking at Salman Rushdie's technique a lot, although I can't say I'm always a huge fan of the stories themselves. So, yeah. I mean, I'm not a huge fan of his perspective on things. So, and it's very difficult to take out perspective from craft because sometimes the perspective informs the craft, right? Yeah. So, Rushdie has characters who, oh my God, mansplain a lot. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And that's where he does his info dump. Like everybody is basically mansplaining to everybody else. So can I do, can I use that technique of like characters talking to each other without making them annoying mansplainers? Uh, still trying to figure that out. <laughs> On the other hand, that's, you know, a realistic conversation technique, unfortunately. Uh. Oh, but yeah. as, as you know, Bob can get awfully tiring fast. Sure. You guys. Yeah, well, yeah, definitely. Um, so when you're writing for Indian publication, are you writing in English or a different language? I'm writing in English. I mean, India, OK, I used to work at Penguin India. Penguin India has nearly the same output as Penguin UK, apparently. That's what I heard. Like, we did so many books, all in English. And it doesn't have the same footprint because book prices in India are lower. Mm -hmm. So when you like convert it all to dollars, it doesn't or pounds, it doesn't look like India is selling the same number of copies. But India is selling a large number of copies. Like we have a large English readership. Our book prices are just half the US price. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm reading for that writing for that audience. I I, I don't write entirely well <coughs> in Bengali or Hindi. I read them. I, I'm not a fiction writer in them. How else has your editing work influenced and informed and changed your world building techniques in writing the stories? I mean, my biggest complaint about editing is that it makes my writing slower. Because I'm, I'm like constantly writing a line and then looking at it for five days from the editorial gaze. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, just the thing that I said about world building, like my first story, which got accepted, um, was completely like, I, I didn't really analyze it structurally. I wrote it and it went through. 
and then a few other stories got rejected and i had to go back to that story and like my own story that got reject got accepted and see what it it was doing structurally mm -hmm. that the other stories weren't doing so i guess my understanding of editing helps me like gives me a clear insight into that or other people's writings but i'm not sure if that makes me a better writer or a better editor like i've started i've certainly also become a better editor by mm -hmm. like you know analyzing craft more and more and more so i've noticed that i i do developmental edits on like other people's stories a lot better than i did say 2 years ago mm -hmm. but i don't know if that insight or clarity has entirely seeped into my own writing is i just still take a very long time well a lot of us take a long time <laughs> i think i think it's uh it depends very greatly on the person and you know just how their how their technique works how their ideas come together so it it sounds like you have a very conscious writing process about structure and plotting and character and world building and since um since this is uh dive into world building <laughs> uh, a world building question which is you know um in addition to like the techniques used by authors of secondary world fantasies i was wondering when you're making the choices uh about what details to include uh, and you mentioned that you include the whole background history of a uh, tribal god that wouldn't be known to presumably any of your readership but other than other than that what details do you do you include in your world building so that the reader isn't confused and what do you like just sort of let wash over like maybe the reader doesn't know what this this you know practices or this take or this thing is in the world and you'll just you know let the reader puzzle it out because it's not important to the story Are there how do you how do you make those calls and when you construct a world so that it's not like you know a ton of exposition in a little bit of story so this helps me partly because i'm writing this circus world where um nearly everybody's the other right mm -hmm. um, like people are the other even to each other and also because the circus is traveling so when two characters meet each other they're also unknowns to each other and i write largely from the character's first person perspective and in each story it changes so like each of them is a first person story from a different character's perspective and so when one person meets another person that person is still doing a very info dumpy observation because that person's like uh, that that person's weird and then that person in their mind is like taking in all the details about mm -hmm. that person so it comes into the narrative except that the person who's doing the reading is probably also weird <laughs> it's just that they have a sense of what's normal from inside their head mm -hmm. so they're like i am weird but everybody i meet is normal and then i meet this one person who is a different kind of weird so then i'm still doing a close reading of that person because i don't know what kind of weird they are and because the perspective change from story to story in one story you may not notice the narrator's weirdness but in another story when that narrator becomes an observed subject somebody else notices that oh that person has these weird things about them mm -hmm. so it's like a lot of mirrors placed in like weird parts of the narrative mm -hmm. like oh, a lot of these like hidden mirrors where you suddenly get like a view of a character that you wouldn't otherwise that's cool i think it fits well with the uh whole world concept of the circus and almost like funhouse mirrors and stuff right 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 but with a long narrative where you have an unreliable narrator uh huh the biggest challenge sometimes is to bring out the framework of the unreliable narrator on the page mhm mm what are the biases of the unreliable narrator what are the one things in their head that they're not saying right yeah. 
So by flipping the narrator, sometimes I manage to do the thing where, like you approach something like objectivity, mostly with like so many subjective cases that, I mean, it's an amalgam. So you ha in, in the stories, you're using multiple points of view in sequence? Um, no. So each story is one person's perspective. And so far that I've written five stories, they're all, well, there's a loose progression, but they're all largely standalone. Mm -hmm. so, so there are some events that, like a very small overlap that gets seen through different characters' gazes in different stories. Mm -hmm. But they're not parallel, like they're not parallel narratives of the same event. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the last, the latest story that got published from that series is, um, it's called The Trees of My Youth Grew Tall, and it came out in Strange Horizons last month. Yes. Mm, and it's the perspective of an old lady who has come from the village to the city, and her framework gaze is that she belongs to a tribe of humans, who lived in trees and so they she's like constantly looking at ground humans as ground humans mm -hmm. and um, and she's like from her gaze the city is foreign so she's like constantly saying this is what city people do it's weird like I am learning that this is how city people work yeah. out and uh, she comes with her son and in the middle of this story like I'm okay to spoil this story because it's already published <laughs> um she comes to the city with her son and like a group of other people from their tribe and her son alienates like fights with everybody in the tribe like everybody who's there so the their little family unit gets alienated and then her son runs away so she's suddenly like left alone in the world where nobody wants to take care of her and She's not the kind of woman who's ever been independent in the world. Mm -hmm. So, and from this story, I guess her son just looks like a complete jerk, which her son clearly is. Like, you know, he's an adult son who leaves his, like, you know, elderly, illiterate mother, extremely poor mother in this city, which he doesn't understand. And he just runs away and you never hear about him. But also, so the son looks like a jerk, and in this story, the son... But you don't entirely know if the son is dead or something, because the mother doesn't know either. The mother goes around looking for the son, and yes. he's not finding him. Um, then there's a novelette from this series coming out from Tor.com in January. And the novelette is the son's perspective. Mm, interesting. So, like, the son is the protagonist, and you realize that... The son basically left and joined the circus. So the circus is not so much in the old woman's story. But yeah. the son left and joined the circus and well, clearly forgot to say bye, so he is a jerk. <laughs> and like for years, she never even hears anything from the son. But in the son's story, there are like lessons that the son is learning, totally unrelated to the mother, like other lessons, like how to be a person in the world. Mm -hmm. Like he loves people and then he hurts them and he hurts them because of like some weird toxic masculine values and then I mean that was my toxic masculinity story mm -hmm. from like the inside the head of a man so like his this guy clearly doesn't think of himself as a bad person but he has some like very old school masculine codes of honor which don't work very well in mm. the practical world right yeah so i mean he's clearly a character who's supposed to get the reader's sympathy but once again he's also the jerk who left his mom out there in the city and right which, which is something i mean it's probably true to a lot of us as people in the world as well right like a lot of us are good human beings and then there's somebody in our life that we did not care about that's interesting yeah good point oh. so 
I don't know if that was a complete ramble. No, that's that's interesting. Um, it, I mean, it seems like you're building toward a collection of interwoven stories at some point. Um, do you do you envision doing that kind of like a book of these stories and shaping a narrative out of the like a, a bricolage kind of approach? Um, yes, I mean, a book is the plan, but I, because like when I started writing these stories, I did not have a plan and I did not even know what anybody would publish. Mm -hmm. I, one of my plans was to write them as like short stories and try to sell them as short stories and then do a complete revision and meld them together as a novel. Mm. A mix up. Mm -hmm. And once I like this is largely what I tried to do at my MFA, which I finished in January. So it was I, I took two and a half years. Mm -hmm. um, I was trying to write these as an overarching narrative. And then I realized that because I did not do a conscious world building, um, the stories had a lot of elements that did not match up. Mm. So the world doesn't actually have unity. Partly because, I mean, Hinduism is not like Christianity. It's not a religion with a main scripture. Mm -hmm. It's like a group of practices that are like somehow stuck together, right? And so, so technically, Hinduism is also a disparate world building. And even if you draw only characters from that, it's it's still not an internally consistent world. Mm -hmm. And I'm still struggling with that because like all these characters, like they are the chaotic column, you know? Mm -hmm. So they don't particularly have a plan. Like I kept writing each story, but when I tried to make it a novel, I saw that they don't really have a goal. They don't really have a common enemy. They're like just traveling. They're like surviving. Mm. So I'm still struggling with that too. Well, I think it's not necessarily, uh, I mean, a lot is made, how am I gonna say this? In the West, we tend to make a lot of, of consistency, right? Um, but depending on what kind of world you're working in and what kind of narrative context you're creating, consistency, consistency doesn't have to be the basis for the world. I think there are um, a number of uh, a number of worlds that uh, have a little bit of uh, chaos and unpredictability in them. Um, but this point. because I was trying to learn how to write a novel, like a fantasy novel, it's usually that you have a consistent magic system. Mm -hmm. I mean, for the same reason that your reader is also trying to solve with you. Mm -hmm. so, there's something like even if there's like one trickster character like you know in all these old myths right mm -hmm. so, i mean it's still controlled chaos like you know the cer certain things that a trickster character wouldn't do or can't do yeah or there, there's a certain framework to the world which will not get violated if that framework gets violated then your reader actually gets thrown off yeah so, I mean, I read a lot into, I mean, this is like the structural work I do for my editing clients and so on as well. Um, a lot of fantasy readers' feedback is very vague because fantasy readers largely, unlike literary fiction readers, the large body of fantasy readers are not literature students, so they don't speak theoretically. Mm. When somebody says that this is where I got thrown off by the narrative, right? Mm -hmm. They're basically like, or they say that this did not feel believable. And I'm trying to solve for that. Like, what did they say? What does that mean? Yeah. Um, I'm trying to, like, I'm basically looking at that, looking at certain expectations that broke, like the narrative consistency broke for them, right? Yeah. So, 
even when people say that you know why is this gay character there we're like where what's the function of this gay character why is there a gay character with no function right mm-hmm. so they're coming from i mean apart from a biased perspective and other things they're coming from a perspective where science fi- in science fiction everything that's even slightly off a very narrow norm is there for a purpose mm and that's like like a clue in the plot right yeah so so yeah i mean readers tend to not like chaos that has no internal order i mean that's at least that's what i learned i mean i'm i'm trying not to be prescriptive about these things mhm that's very interesting um yeah i think you know i think um well yeah i can think of a couple of people who have told me recently that they don't want their worlds to be too predictable <laughs> um and the two people that i can think of are um well okay so one of them hasn't told me this directly but the other one has laura ann gilman um working in her um devil's west series is working with a magic system that is pretty unpredictable and and you're always kind of discovering new wrinkles to it um so i'm i wonder how that would fit into um your uh, concept of magic systems and i think also nedia korfor has um made public statements about how um uh, a lot of the magic stuff that she uses in her world is just there it just you know you don't have to explain it. it doesn't have to connect to anything else it just does this thing because it does this thing and you know i these these stories are very effective in their own ways so it's um i'm glad you brought up the question because i think it's a very fascinating one yeah this this i mean the sander the brandon sanderson oh there has to be schools of magic and this is how it's all laid out is is the common epic fantasy trope but it's as as you mentioned Nadia Cole for Lauren Gilman proved that it's not the only possible way to do magic and world building. By any means, J.R.R. Tolkien also proved that pretty early on, um, and because uh, his magic, magic systems in Tolkien are very, very yeah, are very un. They're they're obscure to pretty much every point of view character. Yeah, their their internal workings are not very clear. <laughs> the yeah. Same, the same can be said for George R. R. Martin's uh, Song of Ice and Fire. The, there's clearly magic with some kind of rules going on, but almost every point of view character is, you know, not wielding magic in any way, directly or indirectly, and therefore is kind of at a loss, you know, with the reader. Yeah. So you're. you're... Oh. oh, sorry. Um. So no, sorry. Um. So. But no, your point of view characters don't have to know it. I mean, the more the point of view character doesn't know it is probably the better because that like adds to your dramatic tension. Mm-hmm. But um, so I read, like I borrowed a lot of lessons from Neri Okrafor, um, Nalo Hopkinson, mm-hmm. and uh, Nalo was one of my Clarion West instructors. And that once again, like what I noticed is that. because they're writers from non-western cultures mm-hmm. their stories structurally are fairly close to magical realism and i i read a lot of i mean i actually haven't read that much american magical realism i i read i mean i grew up reading garcia marquez gabriel garcia marquez and mm-hmm. he doesn't even have a magic system ever like it's just like something random happens in the world right mhm and magic realists largely don't have magical systems but that's kind of because their world is already framed pretty closely by the real world like the their you know the historical events and so on like those are all things that people can find out if they want mm. to like when i read garcia marquez i did not know any of the histories that he was talking about right but like those histories still exist in the world right like they're not completely confusing like when you're a literature student you go do you go study like a reference book mm-hmm. to see what's going on in that world 
right? Mm -hmm. um, so the further towards secondariness that your world moves, um, it's probably structurally more important to leave a decipherable medical system. Interesting. Because it's like not being framed by anything at all. Like if if you move towards complete chaos, like structurally, then what is the reader reading for? Like what connects one sentence to the next? Hmm. That's an interesting. It's an interesting hypothesis. Now I have to go and <laughs> think about that as I as I mull over the things that I've read and read new things. Yeah, I mean, there's a sort of an extreme example in the other way is Tim Powers, who absolutely works out his magic systems and tries to make them as much as possible consistent with the laws of physics. But his he's writing in our world, right? Mm -hmm. his, his histories are secret histories. So they can't contradict any known facts about, say, Lord Byron or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, whoever is a real person who's in, you know, one of his books. So, um, and he's 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 fond of. He was one of my clearing instructors, and he he's fond of uh, saying things like, "Well, an invisibility spell, you can't the the iris can't be invisible, or or light will pass right through it. You'll be blind. So, you know, the eyes part of the eyes have to be visible." Um, or you're blind when you're invisible. Either one is fine as long as, you know, that. And he has no problem with invisibility, <laughs> right, as a magical effect, but, but he wants it consistent with other laws, no laws of physics. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I haven't read Tim Powers, but yeah, I mean, I, I keep reading, like, the more suggestions I hear about these things, like, I keep reading different world building systems from different authors just to get an idea but on the other hand i mean god i mean i recently started like this morning i started thinking about whether i should stop writing a project like a different project that i had planned for quite a few months now like it was probably going to become a novella mm -hmm. and um that was the first time i did an outline like i did a chapter by chapter outline i did you know, structural balancing and all these things, just because in my circus stories, like, my circus stories did not work out very well at my MFA. Like, I, like, the plan that I had for them, right, that thing that I just said, that I was at my MFA, I was planning to turn them into one narrative. Yeah. Like one narrative arc, and that did not work. Like, I passed my MFA by sending them in as a short story collection. Like, an okay, a part of a short story collection, but... I could not structurally turn them into one narrative that I wanted. Mm -hmm. So when I started writing a novella, I decided that I would do a complete chapter by chapter outline and I would do like so that the world is consistent and I know that like the narrative tension is like properly spread out mm -hmm. and like the character is getting narrative space. Like, you know, all the editorial knowledge that I have, I tried to put them into the framework and then do the free write according to the framework. How did that work? It worked really badly. Ah, uh, not. So, I mean, I, after I did all that structural work, I realized that I had lost the joy in writing that story altogether. Like, I really liked it, and the story kept feeling like ticking boxes, you know? Mm. And... It's been around for the past few months. I kept thinking that I will write it when, like, the joy comes back. Because, I mean, the lack of joy does really show on the text. And, I mean, a lot of writers attest this, right? Yeah. If you've, like, written something laboriously and not without happiness, it shows. And that novella had turned into homework for me. Hmm. Like, I don't even have an agent. I don't have a deadline. Nobody is making me write it. And I really like that story. And it's it turned into homework. Like, you know, write these many words for these many chapters. And, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know if I'll eventually discard it and start writing something more spontaneously. Because that story does not have any spontaneity left anymore. Mm. Yeah, I, I had the same problem when I tried to outline a novel. To that in that fashion 
Like part of my brain said, okay, you're done. I'm like, but I haven't written a novel yet. But my brain was like, no, we're done. You have the whole story, you know. <laughs> I must say though, that um, when I was working on my novel, um, I did butt in chair and did some sort of writing basically almost every day. And it became work. Writing is work. So you got to take that into account. Not every day is going to be spontaneous inspiration. Mm. In fact, I think Octavia Butler is famous for saying that um, forget inspiration. It, it's practice that, that brings, um, brings out the best in your writing. So just take that into account the next time if something feels like homework. Maybe it's supposed to feel like homework because you're learning something. Thing. Hmm. Also, well, don't throw it away. You can come back to it in whenever, like a week, two weeks, six months, a year, two years, whenever. And you may go, oh, I know what's missing now. So don't get rid of it. Just saying. I, you know. yeah, yeah, I'm not like actually deleting them off the, you know. Okay, I didn't. I know, I know some people who do that, and it scares me. <laughs> so, yeah, I'll don't share. Your work. <laughs> yeah. I know some people who seem to be doing that, and I go, What are you doing? Um, anyway, so I wasn't sure, that's why I just put that in there, but anyway, but yeah, okay. Well, you know what? It's five o'clock. Oh, yeah. We've been we've been having fun, I hope. So, <laughs> but here we are at the end of the hour. Falls when you're not outlining. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so I'm going to say, Mimi, thank you so much for coming and uh, giving us some insight into your history and your process and your stories. Um, I hope everybody gets a chance to go and look for Mimi's stories out there in the world, and um, appreciate it. Thank you. This was really great. I, I, I thought I wouldn't have anything to say. <laughs> well, you had tons to say, which is great. And it was great stuff. So um, I'm going to stop the broadcast. Great. I will put the links. I mean, should I put the links to the group chat or? Actually, uh, that would be great. I will have to go find the link. Okay. Uh,